Good morning everyone, my name is Chris from Two-Headed Wolf Gaming and welcome to our East Anglia campaign report in front of Britannia. What I want to do in the following minutes is talk a little bit about the goals we had, what we managed to achieve throughout the campaign and what is in store for the future. So let's start with the beginning. Our main goal was to go for the Long Kingdom victory. We started at e as East Anglia and then we became the Northern Sea Empire, thus gaining some extra bonuses. As this Angla, we had a bonus to our income of 200% from raiding and sacking, an ability that we actually should have used a lot more than we have, and I think this was a bit of a mistake if we could call it as such, but I will get more into details further in when we talk about economy. Then we had plus 6 melee skill for all units when in enemy territory, an ability that we definitely used, and plus 50% reinforcement range for all our characters. It's one of those things that we do not notice, although we had a few battles when we put two armies in range of each other, so I guess it happened automatically, and I'm sure it came into good use at one point or the other, especially in the late game. As Northern Sea Empire, we gained a bonus to public order of plus two in all our regions, and a bonus that we actually used to increase the level of taxing we had on our people. With the research that we had available and this particular bonus, we gained a lot more food and a lot more gold towards the end of the game. Plus two influence to our faction leader, this is one of those bonuses that we didn't manage to use because Guthrum, our beast of a general and king, lived until he was I think 86 years old when I closed the game, when I reached the long fame victory which I did on my own. So it didn't come into play for this particular campaign, maybe in the future we can play a little bit more on the political side. Plus 10 unit morale for all our armies. This was definitely a good bonus when fighting the tougher armies. I think it's gonna come into handy maybe in future campaigns. I don't know if other factions get it as well. But definitely when we're going to play on the harder difficulties, we're gonna use this bonus more and more. And plus 25 income from all sources. I don't think I have to say anything more about this. It's definitely a big plus. Then we have achieved the short fame victory. That was the goal that we put up a few episodes in. Since we already had the buildings, two unique buildings, and we needed a few more, we said, you know what, let's make this part of town building a little bit more interesting. We might not ever come back to constructing them in the future or in the near future. Let's go for them right now. And what we had to build, let's say for the long fame victory, because we went for that as well, we had to build a royal martyr's, uh, what is it, a royal martyr mint, a cathedral of Saint Edmund, a grand abbey, a cathedral to Saint Dewi, a cathedral to Saint Cuthbert, and a cathedral to Saint Ringan. And we managed to achieve all of them. In doing so, I've discovered that there's a lot of lore, like I knew there was lore behind every building, especially behind those that are unique, and they are discoverable in all Total War games if you open the encyclopedia. For the moment, let me read to you two of them, the description of two of them. Two of the buildings that we started with, the Abbey of St. Edmund, and also the Martyr's Mint, a building that we have we were able to build in our capital the Abbey of St. Edmund. Edmund was king of East Anglia when the Danish army rampaged across it in AD 8070 and eventually met his end at their hands. He was not the first or the last king to be killed by a Viking army, but it was a, sens a sensationalized version of his death that resulted in a cult forming around him which endured well into the medieval period. As the story goes, King Edmund was initially captured and offered the chance to surrender, but adamantly insisted that he would only do so on the condition that the Danish leader Ivar the Boneless be baptized. 
Other accounts say that he also refused to renounce his faith when challenged to do so, nor would he accept that his kingdom become a vassal of the Danish heathen overlords. In any case, the enraged Vikings tied him to a tree for his insolence, filled him with arrow and beheaded him. Edmund's martyrdom quickly made his, him a beacon of resistance for Christians under the Danish heathen subjection, as shown by the coins etched with his image appearing within decades of his death. Interestingly, once the Danes converted and became widely settled in the region, they too venerated the shrine of Saint Edmund. What about Martyr's Mint? At the beginning of the Viking Age, few Norse peoples would have had any knowledge of coinage apart from some foreign coins that may have entered as a result of trade. Their bullion-based economy, that is, an economy based on the weight and purity of precious metals rather than their form or symbolism, meant that in many cases coins were melted down to make jewelry or ornamental weapons, the most common symbols for, of status for the Vikings. Their arrival in Britain brought them into contact with the monetary economy of the Isles, with each of the main Anglo-Saxon kingdoms having their own coinage system. With Viking settlements came the creation of their own coins, serving as interesting evidence of the amalgamation of cultures that took place. Not only is there evidence on coins which depict both Christians and Viking pagan symbolism, but also that the settled Vikings recognized martyrs such as Saint Edmund of East Anglia, who was purportedly killed by the Danes, then later venerated by them with the, their transition to the Christian faith. So there you have it, a little bit of a background into, into the history of the area, into why is there a abbey to St. Edmund, a call to St. Edmund, in an area where you are a past Viking, a past invader, right, into these lands, a Danish invader. Well, we have a bit of history now, and if you are more interested in all the buildings, in everything that it is to discover, not even in Front of Britannia, in any other Total War game, I do recommend opening the encyclopedia, grabbing yourself a cup of coffee and sitting down to read all the lore and everything that's inside these games, because they're pretty cool. Let's go over the final achievements that I've managed to gain even though I wasn't going for them. We achieved the Long Conquest victory, the first victory we had, the Short Conquest victory, by chance. And then we received a United Kingdom for conquering all the English region, an obtuse angle for completing the main campaign and achieving any of the victory condition, and King of Britons for achieving the ultimate victory. Apparently, I've never played at hard difficulty on campaign, battle and political, because I've also gained this group of achievements for achieving short, long and ultimate victory on hard difficulty. We will see if in the future we will push even further for very hard, we probably will, are going to do some forms of very hard, maybe even legendary, but for now this is where we're at. So let us take some time as we move on further into economy. When it comes to economy, it's as clear as day that we focus on commercial. Not so much on trade, on producing goods to sell, more on the base commerce kind of buildings. And if you are to take a look on our map, we can see that the, our area had mostly unique markets or market halls or the, the cities were the type that would produce different type of commercial goods whether it was uh, mints that produce coins, or whether it is salt, cloth, sometimes a lot of our cities had pottery inside of them, we had a lot of buildings that pushed economy to the limit. I don't think we've played it as well as we could have had. If we have to look at our buildings, like the most rich city we had was Linsil, I think this is how it's pronounced. 
This town produced us a base wave wealth of 8434 8, gold per turn, which was increased by our governor and our tax level, bringing us to 1149 gold per turn. It's a pretty good city, maybe one of the most beautiful that we've had during this campaign. But then I noticed that to the south of us, you know we had this town in middle CX of London that was producing us no gold at the beginning of the game. When I was doing this analysis of our campaign, I realized that they have a unique building in that territory. If we take a look at it right now, because I'll put it on the screen, it gives us at level 3, at maximum level, a penalty of only minus 2 to public order. It has a bit of a upkeep for food and gold, but it provides us with 40% extra income to all sources and plus 30% tradable resource production to all commerce villages in the province. We didn't have those nearby villages, so the tradable resource bonus wouldn't have helped us early on. But that plus 40 to income from all resources, if we just put a base gold production building inside this settlement early on in the game, I think we could have had a pretty productive city. Like one that produced us a thousand gold, maybe 1500 gold early on in the campaign would have been wonderful for us. So I think this is something that would require better planning in the future. Bringing back that ability to sack settlements at 200% bonus to income, like we could have used that ability to the max just going around sacking settlements and using the gained economy, the gained gold to upgrade our commercial cities. I think that would have been the best tactic for us throughout the campaign. And there's one more thing that I want to show you. We only went for a grand abbey, we didn't even build it, we conquered it because it was the fame victory. But the other path of a, an abbey is to go for something like a church market or grand abbey market at level 5, which produces us 25 extra income from commerce in all adjacent regions in all adjacent provinces. So if you have a place with the church, going on this path will provide us with even more gold in the surrounding commercial towns. Something that we definitely haven't used throughout this campaign. Definitely to keep in mind if you are going to play uh, Thrones of Britannia, as East Anglia or as any other territory if you are going for this type of economy. Keep it in mind for the future. If you are going to test this out, Leave it down in the comments below or send, or send me an email, tell me how your experience was, because I'm not going to return to East Anglia anytime soon. So let's see what are we going for into the future. First of all, I have to say that I loved my time with Guthrum in this first campaign we did in Fronts of Britannia, my first ever campaign completed on our Two-Headed Wolf gaming channel. Well, for the future, we're going to do all 10 factions. I don't know exactly how they'll fall into place, but our next target will be Sirsen. Why is that? Well, Scone, the capital of Sirsen, was once home to the legendary Stone of Destiny, said to bestow divine strength on her people. Where the stone now resides is a mystery, but if clues can be found, surely the stone's recovery would be an adventure worth undertaking. So this is what we're going to do next. We are going to look for the stone of destiny, we're going to try to become a well-known leader, a legendary leader at that, as we're fighting throughout the land, and when we discover this strange stones left by our ancestors, we're going to try to find out what they were and if they're still standing today, because maybe one day we will be visiting Great Britain and we might want to take a journey throughout their lands. I have to say that what we're doing most of all 
is just exploring the experience that Creative Assembly provided us throughout Total War Fronts of Britannia. What we're doing is something that we might not be doing on our own, but I think it's pretty fun to explore, to try to play this game in a totally different manner than what we would otherwise do, only to find those gold gems, or however you want to call them, inside this wonderful game. I have to say, first of all, thank you for the support and the feedback that you've provided me with throughout this experience. I look forward to seeing you all in the next campaign. Please consider subscribing to the channel if this is something that you enjoy, if I'm providing you with uh, an experience that you would like to keep uh, watching. Give me feedback, provide me feedback in the comments or via email. I'm open to it and I'm open to any kind of discussions that you would like to have. I wish you all a wonderful day. I've been Christian from Two-Headed Wolf Gaming.